Welcome. Welcome, guys, to the Benjamin Dixon Show. This is a special edition hosted here by Nick. I'm here with Richard Charnin, and we're going to talk about an interesting subject today. The subject today will be exit polls and the 2016 and a little bit of 2004 election. So in the 2016 election, we have exit polls, and they're showing a variance in the results. Richard, why don't you go ahead and just kind of tell us about, you know, who you are and, and what you've been studying and what you've uncovered. Okay, Nick, uh, it's great to be on. A uh, little bit of background. I, uh, uh, I worked uh, in the defense industry when I got out of college. I had three degrees of mathematics, uh, two masters. I worked in the defense industry and numerical control. Uh, company, my company was, uh, built the Luna module. And then I worked on Wall Street for a number of years, and I became a consultant after that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I basically been a quantitative analyst, software developer. Used to call them a scientific programmer, was what we used to call them. And now it's uh, uh, so. What happened was I I worked in, for many companies on consulting assignments uh, using uh, by that time in the nineties spreadsheets, eighties uh, and nineties spreadsheets became popular, and. Uh, I worked on consulting assignments, uh, and in the 2000 election, uh, that's when I started to get concerned. Uh, I saw finally something was wrong. I hadn't been following elections since 1952. Uh, believe it or not, at nine years old, I was following the, the uh, Eisenhower election uh, with uh, Adlai Stevenson. So, uh, and I was a big fan of JFK. Uh, so I've been following elections all along, um, but in 2000, it was a shock to see what occurred. Uh, basically, the Supreme Court stole the election from, from Bush. Uh, Gore was the winner, and he won by popular vote by much more than is indicated. I mean, they, they tell you that he won by 500,000 votes, popular votes, lost the electoral vote by, by three votes, four votes. In, in a, I show that he actually won the popular vote by maybe four or five million. And uh, of course he was way ahead in the electoral vote. Uh, so Al Gore should have been president. It was stolen big time, it wasn't close. They tried to tell you it was close, but he won, he won Florida very, very easily, did not lose the state. Okay, at what that exactly, point- in, oh, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second there, Richard. Uh, what exactly cued you in that there was something wrong to the narrative that was being thrown out there? <laughs> well, um, at the time, uh, first of all, I had been doing some pre-election analysis. Uh, and I, I noticed that every time they print the polls, pre-election polls in 2000, they, they were like, uh, as soon as Gore made a move up, they brought him down again, like CNN. And to me, it wasn't logical that Gore would lose because he was obviously a much more experienced candidate. And uh, even at that time, Clinton was popular. He was popular. And so Gore and the Democrats uh, should have been favored to win. Now, obviously, what happened in the Supreme Court in Florida, they, they – uh, they gave it, they, they stole the election, five to four. And that was obvious to me that Gore won Florida. And, uh, but I had done no, I, I really didn't do any analysis other than my pre-election analysis, which showed that Gore was going to be the winner. But I really didn't get started until 2004. By that time, I was, I was ready for the next election. Talk about talk about your analysis and and how that came to to, to, to to help you make these conclusions that you've made and what those conclusions are. Besides, for Gore won the election. Well, <clears throat> uh, let's go to two thousand and four. Okay, <laughs> that's really where I got started. I did pre I did a pre election poll, uh, not a poll, a model which was used what they call Monte Carlo simulation to calculate the probability of winning an electoral vote based on, based on, based on the pre-election polls. I, so I was, 
<coughs> have to bear with me. I got a little cough. Uh, based on pre-election polls, uh, and uh, which showed that although it appeared to be tied going into the election, there were undecided voters, and it, it and it turned out that I was aware that undecided voters usually go pretty strongly for the challenger. Now, Kerry was the challenger. So if it was tied 47% apiece uh, and you had 6% undecided, you figured Kerry was going to get four or five of those six. So, uh, and, and it agreed with my model, which showed that he, he actually, uh, I was projecting him to get 52%. Now, it turns out I was right. Uh, when the exit polls came out, they were downloaded uh, on election night. Or at least these were the already adjusted exit polls, but they showed that Kerry was ahead. He was he was winning the election, uh, but then late at night, uh, all of a sudden the, the exit polls turned, where Kerry was leading by three or four percent. At the very end, all of a sudden it flipped, and Bush had. It was a 3% winner. Now, I showed that it was impossible that the exit poll would flip that much when you have 600 additional exit poll respondents. Initially, there were 13,000. Gore was ahead by 51 to 48 or 52 to 47. Over the last 600, all of a sudden, uh, Bush picked up the lead. Now, that was mathematically impossible. You know, you already had 95% of the exit poll was completed. So how did he reverse uh, three or four uh, percent? Mathematically impossible. Let me and, let me let me stop you and clarify for 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 the listeners that are out there. So let's say you have an exit poll and you do eight or nine out of ten of the people you're going to poll. So you poll already like nine out of ten people you're going to poll, and then all of a sudden that one last person is able to, sh that last person, you were able to flip the results, which means it's mathematically impossible for you to change the results with just that one last polling respondent. And that's what Richard is talking about here. He's saying basically they either removed votes that were already in the poll and then switched them to someone else, or they either added something to it. Whatever they did, they manipulate the numbers to produce a result that was not possible from just the one remaining respondent. Exactly. Well, in this case, we had... 13,000 respondents. Kerry was ahead. The final 600 respondents, uh, uh, Bush went ahead of Kerry. Now, uh, that was impossible mathematically, okay? It, it meant that Bush had to win all 600, okay? Yeah, he had to win every person. Not a single person must have went for, for Kerry out of the last 600, which is a complete reversal from the trend that was already established yes. for, the first, for, the, for the large swath of the people already polled. It's a complete reversal of that trend, an impossible reversal. Yes, yeah, so let me, let, me, let me make it more uh, dramatic. It was only... Uh, in 2000, we had the preliminary exit poll uh, at 12.22 a.m., which showed that Kerry was ahead. At 1, at 1 a.m., Bush was ahead. Now, they, when you looked at the exit poll printed or on the websites of New York Times, CNN, it showed that there were a total 13,660 respondents and that Bush was the winner. Six or seven years later, it turns out that there were 13,660 respondents, but Kerry won 51.7%. Uh, 51 so in other words, they actually, the unadjusted exit polls, what they did was they flipped it. They took votes, respondents from Kerry, moved them to Bush, okay, and uh, that was clear manipulation. The actual numbers, it's on my, it's on my website blog, spreadsheet, 2004, shows that Kerry was the winner all the way from the beginning, let's say after 8,000 respondents, he maintained a lead of 51, 52% all the way through to the, to the, to the end, to 13,660. So you have absolute clear proof that they manually took 
the, the numbers that they got in the unadjusted exit poll and they flipped a, a certain percentage, about six or seven percent, they flipped it to Bush. Now, apart from, apart from that, we'll talk about this is 2004 now. Uh, I also proved that <clears throat> with, I created a true vote model where I look at the previous election of returning voters. It turned out that for Bush to have achieved his vote, his recorded vote in 2004, he needed 110 percent of living Bush voters from 2000 to vote in 2004. Now, 110 percent, obviously, you can't have more than who voted in 2000 return in 2004, right? I mean, that's simple. You're going to have a certain percentage are going to are going to die. Actually, about uh, uh, 4 percent, 1 percent a year mortality. And then you have those who are not going to show up. So what you have is uh, you have. If you compare the. The returning voters from 2000, the actual plausible number, you find that uh, there were five, five, five and a half million phantom Bush voters that did not exist. And so that's further proof. Okay. Let me, so let, let me step in here for a second, Richard. So it's interesting that you brought up that basically they flipped the unadjusted exit polling to match the recorded vote. And that's a practice that we've seen play out in this primary here, where there, it seems like the exit polling is being, you know, forced to match the recorded vote. But what's very, very weird about this is that, first off, we have to understand how important are exit polls to elections, and what can they tell us, and 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 what kind of margins of error should there be between the unadjusted exit poll and the actual recorded vote, and then kind of point us in a direction like of other countries that may use the exit polling and how accurate their exit polling is able to be? Well, you're asking me a lot of questions there. I'll try to... <clears throat> yeah, I, I kind of, I, I I kind of front-loaded it there. Okay. Um, I wanted to just reaffirm what I had just stated. You have your unadjusted exit poll, or your... Uh, the, the, so there's two ways of looking at it. The, you always... My true vote model, I look at the prior election, how many voted for Bush? Now, those Bush voters come to 2004, but not all of them can come because some are going to die and some are going to stay home. It's pure, simple logic. But when the, the exit poll shows, and, and when asked how did you vote in 2000, the exit poll shows that there were 52.6 million voters returning from 2000 for Bush in 2004 when there could have been no more than 47 million because of what I just told you. In other words, the mortality rate and also the fact that you don't have 100% turnout of living voters. So uh, so that proves it right there. And then, in, Plus, I gave you the one before that, which proved that they actually had the unadjusted numbers in the national exit poll, uh, which show that Kerry won, was leading all the way, but they flipped it at the end to match the vote. Now, okay, so why are exit polls important? <clears throat> uh, exit polls are important for the reasons I just told you, okay? Uh, if there's a discrepancy, and there's always going to be some discrepancy between the exit poll and the recorded vote, when there's no discrepancy or it's within one-tenth of a percent, which is what you'll find after they adjust the poll and match the vote, the exit poll look like it's within one tenth of a percent of the actual vote. Well, that's that's ridiculous. The exit polls are not that not that accurate. Uh, but you do have a margin of error. In an exit poll, <clears throat> the margin of error is based on the number of people that are polled. It doesn't make a difference if you're polling in in uh, Wyoming or in California, it has nothing to do with the size of the state, the population. It only has to do with the number who are exit polled. So the margin of error is only a function of the, if you have a thousand exit polls in California and a thousand in Wyoming, they're going to give the same margin of error. Forget about 10 million, 50, uh, how many 
30 million in California uh, and only a million in, in Wyoming or whatever, it's irrelevant. It's only a number that you poll. So the margin of error <clears throat> is a, a formula. It's based on a formula, which uh, is a little, a little hard to describe, uh, but it involves the number of voters and also the vote share, the, the, the exit poll uh, shares between the two candidates. There's a formula, square root fun, uh, formula. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I'm not going to go into it anymore. You have to look it up on, on, on uh, Wikipedia, formal definition. The point is this. The exit poll <clears throat> is, is a guide saying that the results, let's say, let's say uh, uh, Sanders had 52%. And you have an exit poll with a margin of error three uh, four percent. That's saying that Sanders there's a ninety percent ninety five percent probability that Sanders is going to be within plus or minus fifty two percent. In other words, it'll be from forty eight to fifty six percent. So in other words, you take you get the the vote the exit poll share and you subtract the margin of error on either side. 95 times out of 100, it's going to, the, the number theoretically should, the, the real number should fall within that range. So when you have a situation like we've got in, uh, in, the, in the primaries, you have 11 primaries where Sanders was above the margin of error in his, in his, in his exit poll, Okay, and it, and yet, the he uh, uh, he lost the election. Okay, or well, his his vote his vote dropped, but he was above the margin of error. So that even though he might not have won, the fact that he was above the margin of error indicates that he had at least a 97, uh, 97 or ninety-eight percent chance that the exit poll, the probability of that occurring, was like. 2% or 1% or 0%. So what I did was I calculated for all the primaries, I've got the exit poll, the final vote, the difference, the margin of error, and the probability that this would occur. Now, you know, uh, what you have is 11 exceeding the margin of error, and the probability, which blows people's minds, but it's true, is 1 in 77 billion. You would expect that in 20, 20, uh, 26 exit polls, only one or two would exceed the margin of error. One or two. So you're saying that um, it's not just that his recorded vote share was actually smaller than, 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 than what was recorded. I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me. His, his true vote might likely have been higher than what was recorded for the recorded vote. You're saying the likelihood of so many exit polls being outside outside of the margin of error for the recorded vote is also highly unlikely, especially billion. in this instance. Now, do they all show a pattern? Is it is it random or does it all produce the same result? No, no, they did they differ. In some cases it's just barely above the margin of error. In other cases it's far far above the margin of error. The further it is above the margin of error, the lower the probability. So, <clears throat> uh, but the fact is that what you should have, see there are two things that I calculate. One is disregarding the uh, margin of error. We would expect that the, the, the recorded vote would, half the time it would go towards uh, Sanders and half the time it would go towards Clinton from the exit poll. In other words, but when you have 24 out of 26, it's like a basket. It's like a basketball player. He's got, let's say, he's a bad foul shooter. He shoots 50 percent at the foul line. Now, what are the chances that he's going to get 24 out of 26? He's going to sink 24 out of 26 foul shots. Same thing. It's like flipping a coin. 50 percent probability. Probability in that case is one in a hundred ninety thousand. So, so basically, 
let, let me break in again. What you're explaining is that the trend is that it, it tends this, this variance has all gone in one direction for the, the vast majority out of the numbers, a number of exit polls. The trend all seems to point in one direction. So if it was a random occurrence between two candidates, as the number increases, we would expect there to be, you know, closer and closer to 50 percent, maybe, you know, with a variance here and there. However, in this case, you said 24 out of 26 of the contests, the discrepancies all go in one direction. Right. Uniformly almost. Now, varying in magnitude, of course. But what's yeah. happening is the trend is in one direction. Yeah, it's called the law of large numbers. Yes. You're flipping a coin. Uh, the more coins you, the more flips, the closer the total is going to get to 50%. It's called the law of large numbers. You might get 7 out of 10 to be heads, but then it's going to slowly, uh, when you get to 40, 50, 50 flips, it's going to be very close to 50% each, heads and tails. So it's a very simple, basic probability concept. The one with the margin of error, however, is, a, is more complicated. Because there we're looking at the actual magnitude of the change, not just the change plus the minus. <laughs> we're looking at the magnitude and the margin of error, as I said, uh, which uh, basically uh, when at, at the point at which you're at the margin of error, let's say the exit poll is exactly the margin of error away from the vote, there's a 97.5% probability that uh, that it's a valid election, or let's put it this way, it's a fair election, or a two and a half percent probability that that would occur, that you would be a margin of error above the recorded vote. Now, if you two, if you double the margin of error, then it gets down to zero. Okay, all this is in my blog, and people can see it. Now, I just want to mention one thing. As long as we're on this topic, this is very important for people to understand this. I have done an analysis of a presidential elections from 1988 to 2008, where I looked at 274 state exit polls over the six elections. Uh, almost, almost half, 135, exceeded the margin of error. You would only expect 14 out of 274 to exceed the margin of error. But half of them did, 135. 131 moved in the direction of the Republican. The probability of that occurrence, in other words, every election, the Democrat did better than his recorded vote indicated. Uh, in actuality, I'm going to throw out the numbers, very simple. Over the six elections, the Democrat president on the exit poll basis one uh, at, was leading 52 to 42 percent, six percent third party. On the recorded vote, the Democrat was leading by 48 to 46 percent. You have an eight percent difference in margin. So that is to me proof beyond any doubt that the movement, the, the one-sided shift from the exit poll to the vote proves election fraud. So this is nothing new. I'm going back to 1988. Democrats, in my opinion, well, the numbers show that they won, definitely won five of the six elections, and I believe they also won the sixth in 1988. Uh, uh, we have the same phenomenon with returning voters, more returning voters than were alive. Got to get put into the exit poll uh, crosstab to match the recorded vote. Let, let me let me step in here for a second, uh, Richard. So so what you're saying is again, just like we've seen in this primary, that you went back and chronicled elections from 1988, like you just said, and you see that same trend occurring where it appears that Democrats do poorer in the recorded vote than than their than their exit polling would would have them you know have them winning. So yes. and and the trend is is completely one sided. You said how many out of how many? Did the, did the trend go to Republican? 131 out of 135? That exceeded yeah, the margin of error? The margin of error. 131 out of, 135 exceeded the margin of error, uh -huh. which, was, which was a zero probability 
and 131 and 135 exceed the margin of effort of Republicans, which is another zero probability. You would only expect half would go either way. So, uh, so the odds of this occurring are one in trillion, 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 trillion. Okay? Yeah, virtually impossible, more or less. Totally impossible. I want to. I want like to use this. Let me use this analogy. Go ahead. You know the universe is finite. Most people think it's infinite. There are a trillion, trillion stars in the universe, estimated. Uh, one, that's a trillion times a trillion. The numbers that I'm I'm using in probability calculation are a trillion times a trillion, taken eight or nine times. So there are more. The probability is lower. And if you were to pick out, if I asked you to pick out one star in the universe at random, or you pick out and you can see if you get that star, the chances of you picking the star is greater than than that the the, the uh, elections were clean. In other words, the probability of fraud is is uh, uh, is greater than your the chance of you getting one of the uh, stars in the universe. I just throw that out. Okay. Okay, um, here's, here's, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to be a little bit critical here. So when I talk to people and I bring up, I bring up some of the points that you've made here and, and I bring them up as some sort of evidence, what they'll say is, well, exit polls really don't mean anything. And that what about, what about people that vote by mail or, or, and that's not captured in the exit poll. And I was like, how is that any type of, any type of retort? It, it actually shows a, a failure to understand how polling actually works. If you get a representative sample, is the argument I make, then it doesn't matter who's voting by mail or who's not. They should be a representative vote of the state as a whole. But go ahead and uh, just kind of give me the counter argument to that when they say that exit polling doesn't mean anything because it doesn't capture, you know, early voting or something of that nature. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would turn the question around. I would say, why would you think that early voting would be any different than voting on Election Day? Well, that, that's kind of that's kind of what I said by saying if it's a representative sample, it should line up. You know, there's no reason to believe that early voting would not be would be uh, different than what's reflected on election day, and the true vote I'm talking about. Now, remember, on election day, they can rig the polls. Early voting, presumably, that if they voted on machines, they could still rig those those uh, numbers as well. But I'm going to make the statement that the exit pulses do take into account early and absentee estimates of early and absentee voting. So if your early voting is like, I don't know, 10, 20 percent, it's still it's still overwhelmed by the by actual voting on Election Day. And there's no reason to suspect that people would vote any differently than they do on Election Day. In fact, uh, uh, you might find that uh, people say, well, people, uh, voters, they give you these stories, voters can lie about who they voted for, or they voted early, or they voted late. Uh, the exit polls are professionals. They know how to run the polls. They take into account various factors to, to, uh, uh, to adjust based on circumstances. Uh, as an, you know, so... Uh, if, if someone were to say, uh, you know, that uh, candidate A at 60 percent early, but on only 45 percent on Election Day, then I would say, well, why is that? Why is that? Uh, because, because they're more motivated? I don't know. Uh, nobody's ever convinced me that Democrats are more motivated than Republicans. In fact, vice versa. The evidence has shown People said that the, Dem the Republicans were shy, reluctant Bush voters was very big in 2004. That, that was put out by the exit pollsters to explain the differential. It turns out Republicans are not shy about saying who they voted for, especially in Republican precincts, districts. So that's a, that's a canard. There's a lot of people uh, knock exit polls, but the fact is uh, there's no documented empirical proof that the exit polls 
are biased, okay? We're, we're taking a look. The pollsters are, are doing samples, random samples over a well-designed, and they, they themselves say the design is perfect across the voting locations uh, or close to perfect. So uh, <clears throat> nothing is perfect. Nobody's claiming the polls are exactly right. But when you're off by 4 or 5%, in an exit poll with a, uh, a margin of error that's 3% or 2%, uh, that is a, that, that's a very strong indication. Now, you know, the same pollsters that run our exit polls here do the exit polls in Europe. And there, the, the, it's a totally different situation. They, they compare the exit polls to the vote, and they're usually very close. And if they're off by more than 1% or 2%, then they say, this is, they take another look at it. They're surprised. In this case, we're off by 7 8% on the uh, margin, and that's totally beyond the pale. Okay? you got to be within the margin of error. Once you go exceed the margin of error, that should raise a red flag. Hopefully, I've, I've, I've uh, addressed the issue. Yeah, um, l l let me ask you another question. And... I know you've already been through this, so you're saying that the same people that do the polls here in the United States also do these in other countries, and for some reason in those other countries, they're able to get the, the polling fairly accurately. Um, here in the United States, they do the polling very accurately, but it seems that if you look at the uh, – in the primary, if you look at the Democratic exit polls versus the Republican exit polls, Republican exit polls are, are very, very close – and the, the the large variances only tend to to happen on the Democratic side. What do you where do you suppose that actually is? <clears throat> well, the they're accurate here when they do exit polls. It's not the exit polls that are inaccurate. It's the votes. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. And when people say, "Oh, the exit polls are always wrong," they're off. But they never consider that there's election fraud. And, you know, the whole thing is very ridiculous. Even the pollsters won't mention the fraud word. They, they, they say, oh, well, you know, every election is the same story. Well, we were off by 3 or 4%, but they were early polls, and, and you can't really, you know, we had, uh, you know, but the excuses they gave, I've proven, are inadequate by actual numbers, okay? <clears throat> so the... Uh, Exopolicists do a good job here, but then they go to that final, they make the final step of taking the result and matching to the vote. Okay? Now, that's not what they should do. They're assuming, they're, uh, they're, they're, it's implying that the vote count is absolutely perfect. So that's why they're, ch and the exit poll was wrong. So that's why they're adjusting it. But that's a very bad assumption to make. It just so happens that our elections are uh, much more vulnerable to uh, hacking and uh, uh, manipulation than in other countries like Germany, uh, where, where they they don't really screw around with the exit with the polls or with the votes. They're much more honest, as I said. The Harvard, or I mean, I said it before we got on. Harvard University did a study of Western democracy election voting systems. We were ranked dead last in, in, uh, among Western democracies in the Western Hemisphere. I think I was around 37 or 40. Uh, that the study is available. It was just done recently, and. Uh, of course, the mainstream media won't talk about that study. Why are we ranked last? Well, obviously, we did, you know, it's the way we run the elections. We don't have the proper controls. What, what would some of these controls actually look like to actually help us have a, a better election system? But before I ask that, let me go back. You say we rank dead last. What are the factors they're actually rating us on? Uh, I can't. I. <laughs> um, the, uh, the processes that we use, in other words, the accuracy of the results, the election 
uh, the the uh, um, the steps that are taken to ensure a good election. In other words, even Jimmy Carter, president, is very critical of our election system. He himself said uh, we, we rank very poorly. In other words, the, the over, oversight of the process, we know we have machines that are uh, uh, both voting machines and central tabulators. We do not have access to the, to the programming code. It's proprietary. That should tell you all you have to know. Why is it that we can't look inside the machine at the code? There's only one reason. They don't want us to look. And this has been going on for, since 2002. Okay? It's proprietary. So what they can do is they can program the machines to flip votes. And that's what they do. Uh, if, if it was all on the up and up, it would be proprietary. Plus, now here's what we can do. Okay, you're asking me, what can we do to eliminate the fraud? Well, it's really a, 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 a couple of things. Unfortunately, they, they won't be done because the election officials and politicians don't want of, of absolutely fair elections. I hate to say it, but it's true. If they did, they would have done something about it 10 years ago. Now, here's how you solve the problem if you want to solve it. First of all, you do hand-counted paper ballots. You post the results on the wall at the precinct. You upload those results, all the votes on the, that precinct, up to the Internet on, a, on some um, uh, server. But the, the software is open source software that's written by individuals who are collaborating it's available for you or I to look at if we wanted to. And the, the voting machines are not proprietary, built by right-wing organizations. So you have a totally transparent system. Now, the vote count on the precinct wall had better equal the vote count of the precincts on stored online. Just like, you know, like as if you would go to look at your bank account, you go online, look at the precinct, you see your code number, you don't see your name, you see your code number, and you know who you voted for. And, and all that gets totaled up, it gets tabulated, it's effectively, your, we're, we have our own central tabulators that are online. We don't use proprietary central tabulators at the voting site. Uh, uh, they're they're, they're non-proprietary systems. So we have the transparency. If the numbers from the uh, posted on the precinct wall, do not agree 100% with those posted on online, then we know we've got, got a problem. There should be absolutely zero disparity. That's your solution. You know, we have computer, we use computers for everything, all transactions. It'd be a very simple matter to write a system that would be very difficult to hack. Because remember, you have the votes posted at the precinct. If the system is hacked, there's going to be a difference between the precinct posted tolls and and the numbers on on the uh, tabulator. So, uh, and that's data redundancy. It's data transparency. That's what's needed. Right now, we have neither. We have maliciously programmed voting machines. Okay, we have uh, maliciously programmed central tabulators. You know, they can steal votes right at the machine. Or they can steal it when they, the votes can be ta uh, entered at the machine, sent to the tabulator, where the tabulator gets votes from all different precincts, puts them together, and manipulates the totals. So it's not just the voting machines, okay? It's the tabulators that you don't see. They're in a back room somewhere, okay? Uh, that's your solution. Very simple. Um, uh, uh, you know, you get, you get top programmers – who are everybody, you see, you don't have one group controlling it. You've got a bunch of, it's a democracy. Everybody's working together. Nobody can just go in there and you gum up the system. It's, you've got the controls built in so that it's a collaborative effort. It's called open source program. Okay. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. So 
I, I completely understand that if there's no if there's no transparency there, you know, there is an incentive for fraud, for fraudulent activity to exist because, you know, people some people are going to be very, very high moral standard. They're going to stand on morals and they're not going to do anything. But there are those people who say, if I did this, you know, what are the chances of not getting caught? And because of that, they, just, they look at the system like, well, even if I did do it, there's very, very little to actually, you know, leave a paper trail or anything. It's very, like, it's very little likelihood that I'll be caught doing something like this. Based on that reason alone, I think the, the voting system needs to be more transparent. But why is it that you hear and other people, I mean, you're not the first one to come out and say that, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of variances going on with our election system and the recorded vote and whatnot. You have a mathematician down in Kansas. I forgot what her name was. She's doing the same for her state. You have Harvey Washington. He's out there saying that, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Why, why are we getting a lot of traction? Why aren't more people covering this and investigating what's going on? Uh, now you're getting to my pet peeve now. It all works, you know. These, these conversations are always going the same direction. And ultimately, you know, we lay out the, we lay out the proof, and then we come to the final, well, I, I don't know if it's final, but the question is why? why? Why is this going on? How come nothing's done about it? First thing you don't have is you don't have the media telling the people that the elections are fraudulent. They're not going to tell you that. Who runs, the, who runs the exit polls? The mainstream media. Six six. Media giants fund the exit polls. The exit posters don't just exist by themselves. They're paid. They're paid by six media giants. Now, why is the word election fraud never mentioned on the mainstream media? Never. Why is it they never discuss the voting machines, how they've been hacked, which, is, which has been proven since 2003? Why do they never discuss that? They made... a. Uh, uh, there might have been a couple of feeble attempts, but whoever tried quickly lost their jobs. Okay, people who tried to early on, like Keith Olbermann in 2004. If you remember Keith Olbermann, MSNBC, uh, he had uh, after 2004 election, there were all kinds of anomalies coming in. Vote counts didn't match. Uh, uh, there were more votes than there were voters in a, in a, in a county. So he did a, a very good expose within just a few days. Well, he didn't last too long on, on MSNBC after that, uh, maybe a couple of years, but he, couldn't talk, he wouldn't talk about election fraud after that. So you're not getting any traction because the media is involved in, in the problem. They're complicit. Now, who, who's instructing the media? Are they running the country? Well, I don't think ultimately the media is in charge. It goes beyond them. And I'll just have to let your imagination run wild. Uh, let me let uh, me take the conversation, you know, let me take the conversation in actually a different direction. So when you actually bring this to people and you and you put in front of them all the evidence and you get like a lot of pushback, you know, they'll just say it's a conspiracy or this doesn't prove anything or whatnot. It's like, what, what, what is actually happening there? Like, you've proved mathematically that what's being shown in the exit poll, which is done scientifically, and what's being recorded in the recorded vote being outside of the margin of error, which is scientifically not, not possible, you know, the farther out you get. Um, how do they square the circle? Like, why doesn't it resonate like it should? Well, first of all, let me just say this. <clears throat> it's not just the exit polls. We have other, you mentioned uh, Beth Clarkson, the uh, PhD in Kansas, and myself, we've all done independent work looking at actual votes in precincts, going from small to large precincts, how they diverge. Uh, the Republican goes up as the precincts go up and in Democratic, in Democratic locations, which is counterintuitive. So what I'm saying, it's not just the exit polls. We have... We have a few different uh, uh, techniques which are counterintuitive, which support, and they all come together and, and they all confirm each other. I did a true vote model, which is somewhat based on exit polls, but also on just on pure number of returning voters. And uh, uh, it matches the, my results from my models match the exit polls fairly well. So why does it not resonate? 
Why does it not resonate with people? Uh, <clears throat> I've, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a number of reasons, okay? In some cases, it does resonate. People are, people are aware that uh, uh, fraud exists in our society. And uh, they're aware that fraud could take place. But they don't want to. Be, they don't want to consider the full extent of the fraud. They think it's isolated. Oh, this election could be stolen. But in general, they want to believe that the whoever was elected president was really elected president fairly. Uh, they they don't want to. They don't want to accept the fact, the mathematical fact, that our democracy is not a democracy. That we are not. The votes are not getting counted as we cast them. That is a terrific blow to the American psyche. Uh, you brought up as a kid thinking that uh, you live in a democracy and your vote counts. It's very hard to accept the fact that, that the evidence, the vast amount of evidence shows that there's fraud, election fraud, and it's rampant. Um, it destroys one's confidence in the whole system because if you have election fraud, Every other topic that is discussed is secondary. And that's why I'm disappointed that in this election, the uh, all this election fraud discussion is basically limited to people on Facebook or activists, uh, but the mainstream media doesn't touch it, doesn't touch it. So uh, if they did and they allowed people to debate and discuss the mathematics and, and all the factors, people would become educated. People do not have the patience to, to uh, uh, do any analysis on their own, or they're not qualified. Uh, they don't have, they, they don't have, they, they numbers scare them. They don't want to touch it. Uh, or they don't, their attention span is too, is limited. Uh, I happen to be uh, kind of an individual because of my background, my experience with I've been I've been programmed computers for 50 years, uh, solving problems all quantitative. I take certain things for granted, you know. It might appear to be very easy to me, but the average person, uh, you know, has a bit of a problem. Like even when we were discussing margin of error, uh, you know, uh, it, it's to me it's very straightforward. But I, I've been living with it for all these years now. So it's a combination of factors. There are people, there's willful denial that the government's not telling the truth, that the votes are not getting counted accurately, <clears throat> and uh, that the, the elections are being fixed. Okay. Um, luckily for us, we did have the exit polls, which are really the only, uh, even the exit polls can be fixed, you know, anything's possible. Uh, uh, I'll give you another, another one little, little thing. thing. Uh, I, was I was using, using exit poll analysis, analysis. And, then and then all of a sudden, 2012, 2012, the national election pool, which runs the exit poll, said they were not going to exit poll all 51 states, 50 states. 50 states. They were they not going to exit poll in 19 states. states. The excuse, the excuse they, they gave was that it was too expensive. <laughs> and, you know, it would have cost a couple million more, maybe, uh, to do 19 states. So now what they just did, they stopped exit polling after the, you know, just uh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, what the, Indiana, I think, was the last election. Um, they're not exit polling in California, uh, not exit polling in New Jersey. The question is why? Why? California, you got the biggest state in the United States. So what people are doing is setting up their own citizen exit polls. And... Uh, not that it's going to make much of a difference, but at least we'll be able to say, okay, the professionals didn't do it, but we did it, and we're coming up with these numbers, and it's showing discrepancies. So give us something to talk about. Uh, now, I hate, to, I hate to cut you off, Richard. We've actually uh, uh, run out of time, but what I would like to do is uh, if you have any time to maybe have you back on and we can discuss some some further topics, especially when we talked about the conversation of making the elections verifiable 
as a, I know I focus particularly on the exit polls because that's what we have in front of us. That's quantitative. Also, you know, we have access to it and this is the full, this is the full data. This is really the only way we really have to verify the other techniques you talk about where you actually examine the, the margin of the vote share and you look at the demographics of the area and you can look and see that as the precinct becomes larger, even in the heavily Democratic precinct, you'll see that the Republican vote starts to move up and the Democratic vote will move down in a very inexplicable way. And it's completely counterintuitive to the way the rest of the state has voted. I, I understand all of that and what it means, but I think for the most part, most people, you know, it's a lot of data to hold inside your head. You have to have a mathematics background and you have to you have to understand, you know, that this is a logical argument we're making. Fraud, this is a logic. It's, it's just straight logic. It's not about, you know, what you feel about elections or what you feel about a presidential candidate. This is, we have a system and, and we've done, we have various techniques to verify or take a look at the actual results. And we're finding that a lot of these results aren't necessarily accurate. And, you know, now that we know that, that may be the case, we need to figure out a plan of action to kind of move forward and make sure that going forward, we can have more accurate vote counts. And I, I think what you're doing is is magnificent. I think, um, you know, when they started making attack, when they started attacking you and they attacked Tim Robbins and they, they said it was all nonsense, but they offered no, no analysis, no evidence whatsoever. It was all just an opinion piece. That's when I knew that, you, you know, you're really on to something. And I, and I hope all of our viewers out here can take from this understanding you know, what exit polling is, the polling science, what's important and what we should keep from this conversation. And then, you know, go out and tell your friends and just make everybody aware that this is something that we all need to be caring about. I want to give you some time to go ahead and uh, tell everybody about your blog and how they can reach out to you. OK, I, let me just say, Nick, uh, you're a fantastic interviewer. You're very knowledgeable. Uh, I, I've been interviewed by a lot of very good people. And you're you're right there, man. I. I got to congratulate you on on the way you uh, uh, the questions you asked, and uh, you're obviously very knowledgeable. Uh, and I sure look forward to coming back. Now, um, my what I would suggest is a couple of ways. Very simple. You can go to Google and just Google my name, Richard Charnin, right? Richard Charnin. That'll give you a whole all kinds of links. Uh, my my blog. Is richardchannon.wordpress.com. Richard, we, oh have, we have to wrap it up. We have 10, 10, 15 seconds. We got to get off for Ben to get on. richardchannon.wordpress.com, and you may want to buy these two books. That the first book is Proven Election Fraud and Reclaiming Science: A JFK Conspiracy. Oh, no, 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 geez, no, no, not not reclaim. Um, oh, geez, the other book is uh, Matrix of Deceit. Oh, Matrix yes. of Deceit and oh, really? Proven Election Fraud. I gotta, we got to gotta go ahead and end the call, though. All right. Okay. So I, I put up the wrong book. But, yeah, the, the, they can pick those up. That's uh, Kindle books, very inexpensive. And I look forward to coming back again, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.